Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hello, everybody. It's uh, Tim Neary here. I am editor of sister publication to Smart Property Investment Real Estate Business, and we'll be hosting the Smart Property Investment Show today in place of regular host, Phil Tarrant, who is away at the moment. Joining me on the show today is property investor, Julia Tita. Hello, Julia, and uh, welcome to the show. Hi, great to be here. Now, interesting case that we've got on the show today because you actually um, live in Hong Kong, but all of your investment properties here are in Australia. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So uh, I guess just for a quick overview of my situation. So I am Australian. I left Australia about five years ago with work. I moved across to Hong Kong and I've been um, there ever since. Um, and I started my property journey in Australia some time ago. So I thought I might continue out here. Fantastic. Now let's get into that property journey. You were telling me that you've got six properties. I do indeed. So um, um, I, I was very fortunate a couple of weeks ago to close, to win at an auction um, just in Sydney. So the settlement of that will be taking place in a couple of weeks. But yeah, so that'll be my sixth, assuming it all goes well. Let's, let's assume that it will go well. There's no reason <laughs> not to. So that's your, you were saying your second property in Sydney and you've got a couple of others in Melbourne? Exactly right. So um, if you like, I can talk you through let's, in, let, in yeah. chronological order. Yeah, yeah. Let's go through in chronological order. Okie doke. So um, the first place I bought was 13 years ago, um, as I mentioned, at the ripe old age of 24. Uh, So that'll give our listeners an idea as to how old I am right now. So first property I bought um, 13 years ago was in Charters Towers, uh, which is in regional Australia um, over in Queensland, not too far from Townsville. So I bought that property just above $100,000. I was uh, fortunate at the time that the property did perform well um, in, in a matter of a couple of years, which then enabled me to buy my second one and so on and so forth. And then you just rolled it on from there? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you went from uh, regional Queensland, the Charters Towers. The next one that you bought was? The next one that I bought was in a place called Eagleby, which yeah. is just south of Brizzy. Um, it took me about two and a half years to to do that. So th- that's how long it took for Charters Towers to go out. So, so I could then refinance and go again. And and what did that cost? The one in Eagle B was just under three hundred thousand. And what's it valued at now? Uh, that's a good question. And you know that hasn't moved much. Okay, so yeah. it's just kind of sitting there. It's kind of sitting and, there. And I want to come back to this a little bit after we've done the sort of the what the portfolio looks like now. Kind of we'll talk a little bit about some of the. The, the moving parts to it. Then from there, you went to, and you bought your third one. That's right. From there, I went to Sydney. Okay. Um, so I bought my third place um, over in the suburb of Paddington, okay. which is in a city not too far from the CBD. So that's a nice little uh, one-bedroom apartment, which cost me at the time just shy of 500000 Terraced units out that way, aren't they? Exactly right, yeah. 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 And that was about 500,000 yeah 480-odd odd. and then from there you went to so from there I went to Orange yep <laughs> that's that's also New South Wales regional New South Wales exactly yeah. right yep so I bought a property on a large piece of land uh, with the intention to at one stage knock down the house and build up three townhouses in its place okay so like an ambitious development exactly yeah, right yeah yeah, yep. yeah. Did you do that? Uh, That is underway. So I secured the DA a couple of years ago and I have made, um, I have commenced works on the property, which in this instance simply made, simply meant needing to lie a a pipe in the backyard to to show to council that I have commenced DA, which means that I've got it for life eventually, essentially. Yeah. And then you said also you've got one in Melbourne and Sydney, which you've just done the Sydney one now. So I guess the next one by process of elimination is Melbourne. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And um, what did you buy there? So in Melbourne, I bought a two-bedroom apartment in Glen Iris. Um, and again, that was just under 500000 and this was in 2015. Okay, so quite a sort of balanced portfolio around Australia and and some that you started with a small one and then you've got the development, obviously, and some bigger ones as well around Melbourne and Sydney. How's it performing? Are there any, any standouts that are going well? Obviously, the first one has gone well to get you going and they, we always talk about the first one's the most important one. But are there any lemons in there? Any ones that yeah, you wish look, would perform you better? A very good question. And, you know, if, if I had my time again, would I, uh, you know, buy exactly the same thing? Absolutely not. Which is the one that you <laughs> wouldn't buy again? If I had my time again, I would stick to capital cities not far from the CBD. Right. So Charter Towers, I, I just, I very simply got lucky. Right. I mean, I wouldn't buy in regional Australia today knowing okay. what I know and knowing what I've learnt. I lucked out with Charters Towers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so capital cities not f- capital cities not f- 
far from the CBD? It's like an hour, 40 minutes? Yeah, look, I mean, if I can get it within that 10 kilometer radius um, where people want to live, where your young professionals want to live, where you know what your social demographics are going to be like, that's certainly what I would stick to. That's the sweet spot that you would go to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Let's talk a little bit about the development in Orange. What does what does that look like? Because it sounds like there could be a couple of moving parts to that. There could be a couple of um, different balancing, keeping a couple of things in the air there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I bought that. I want to say maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, as I said, it's a it's a house on a large block of land. Um, you know, the, the house itself is very old. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it. Um, it is thankfully tenanted at the moment. So the house is still there and there's a tenant in it. Yeah, exactly right. Um, however, as I mentioned. I have commenced works on the DA. So we basically got the DA approved uh, to subdivide the land um, and put up three townhouses in its place. But in order for me to do that, I A, need to take down the house and B, I'm going to need finance for that project. And I'm just not there yet. So those are the two working parts because when you when you take down the house, obviously, then you lose the tenant and then you're obviously going to get the finance in place before then because you want that development to take place quickly so that you can get it tenanted again absolutely what's the demand like in in orange for um for tenants for the the vacancy rates there again i've been quite fortunate with with that i mean i haven't had any issues uh finding tenants i've also not needed to change tenants too often i think i've had two sets of tenants throughout you know the time that i've owned the property so again i think a a little bit of luck played played a role there sometimes we make our own luck though don't we yeah (laughs) So of these six properties, which are the which would you say is the are the best performing ones and which would you say are the worst performing ones? Sure. So the one in Glen Iris that I picked up in 2015, so that's the one in Melbourne, yeah. the two better, um, that is probably one of my better purchases. Okay. Interestingly, that was the first property that I bought with the use of a buyer's agent. Ah, so. <laughs> interesting. And, and, and I want to get to that a little bit later as well, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So instead of me trying to, you know, reinvent the wheel and for me trying to find properties that are investment grade from a distance, you know, living abroad, um, I decided to go to the specialists and have them do the legwork for me. And so the the lemons, the ones that you would that you would undo <laughs> if you could. Look, Charters Towers. Again, it was my first property. It just so happened to do very very well in those first couple of years. It hasn't done anything since, and it's been what ten years. That is probably not somewhere I would go again. Uh, Eagleby also. I mean, it, it it hasn't moved in ten years. Okay. Right. It's um, again. I should have paid more attention to the socio demographics, and I should have just stuck to capital cities. But you know, the benefit of hindsight, right? Exactly right. <laughs> and, and I mean, the premise, I guess, of um, of property investment is 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 capital growth, and that it's not going to cost you too much to hold it to make capital growth. So um, that they're not moving is probably not the greatest result for you as a as a property investor that's exactly yeah. right yeah is eaglesby tenanted are, are the, in fact are those two tenanted charters towers as well absolutely so everything yeah. is again thankfully tenanted so they sort of just holding holding their own and at least charter towers gave you something early so that you could get on with it and um and hopefully it'll give you something else as it as it moves as it moves fingers forward. crossed yeah. yeah i mean if you look at it from a helicopter view and you and you sort of extract some learnings i i, I know that you said melbourne used dubai as agent and you were talking about that sweet spot that 40 kilometer radius around the around the cbd of the capital cities but if you were to extract some other information what kind of what would you tell your 20 year four year old self today getting back into the business for the first time as an asset class property is incredibly forgiving um, so although I have made these mistakes over the last 13 years, they, they are, you know, sort of averaging themselves out and it will be okay in the long term. But I think that um, they could have performed a lot better had I made, you know, wiser decisions. So, for example, what I should have done is I, I knew of, you know, the concept of buyer's agents for a long, long time. I knew that they were around, but very th- very truthfully, I didn't want to put, put the money in. Spend I thought the money. Exactly. I'm like, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll find the property myself. Thank you very much. Um, and that didn't necessarily get me to where I could have been today. Yeah, yeah. Case in point, the the property in Paddington here in Sydney, so the little little terrace. It's a beautiful, beautiful one, better um, in a very very nice part of town. Um, however, what um, what the developers did, they took down a giant terrace house and they built a boutique apartment block of seven units. Now the developers did this about fifteen years ago, and they did such a poor oh, really? quality job. I I mean I have had to put 
thousands, literally thousands and thousands of dollars into the strata um, for this particular unit. Now, had I used a buyer's agent, perhaps someone would have raised that to me that it may not be the best investment. So it's just getting a little deeper and a little wider into the into into the research, into the structure of it, I suppose. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly yeah. right. But again, I mean, Paddington as a as a property, it is doing very very well. Um, you know, the capital growth is is exactly what I'm after. But it's just these strata fees that are hurting me. It's that second part of the equation, the the cost of holding. It and that sounds like it's starting to blow out, or it has blown out a little bit more than what you would want it to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Come back to an earlier point that you said about how this asset class is particularly forgiving, and this is probably a good demonstration of how forgiving it is. Yeah. yeah. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask you it anyway. With that earlier sort of the the, the early investor didn't want to spend the money on the buyer's agent, you knew they existed, um, and then you did and you got into something good down in Melbourne. Do you think the money that you spent on the buyer's agent was well spent? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And actually, just to prove that point, so after I made that purchase down in Melbourne, for this most recent purchase here in Sydney, I once again used a buyer's agent because I thought there's no need for me to reinvent the wheel. I know that the guys are around. I know they do a really good job. Why why not, you know, pay them to do what they're good at? And it sounds like now, just listening to you, that you've bought there with some extra confidence in, in that purchase. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I picked up a unit over in Bondi that uh, this buyer's agent were able to go and represent me at auction. I knew that they were going to do the best job that they could. You know, um, we were able to remove as much emotion as possible. Um, and I mean, you know, I'm very, very happy. I saw the unit this morning, you know, all, all's looking good. Lovely. And, and so you did this by remote control because you don't live in Sydney. So it's even more important, I suppose, to have somebody and some eyes and ears on the ground. But I guess the big issue or the big trick is to get somebody that you trust. Absolutely, absolutely. So I live, you know, as we as we mentioned earlier, I do live overseas. I do have my mum and dad who live in Sydney. Uh, so again, using the, the Bondi example, they went in to take a look at the apartment. They said that they would have been very happy to represent me at auction. Um, but again, I just, I wanted to remove any emotion from the transaction. And I wanted to go to the buyer's agent and again, just let them do their thing because, you know, they had demonstrated to me that they knew what they were doing and they knew what they were doing a lot better than I would. Yeah, right? yeah. And that's probably a very good point and a good discipline discipline to have as a property investor is to remove the emotion from it and just treat it as a business, treat it as a transaction. Absolutely. And not a home, which is where there could be a little bit of crossover. Absolutely. Confusion. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, we're talking about trust and buyer's agents. Did you go through a process um, of choosing a buyer's agent or did it sort of just happen quite um, generically? Look, to be honest, I think um, it, it happened quite organically in the sense that um, at the beginning of my property journey, I used to go to a lot of seminars ran by the likes of Chan and Naylor, so an accounting firm up here on the North Shore. And, you know, through their affiliated network, they had um, Michael Yardney from Metropole um, Properties come along and, you know, speak about all the good things that they do so I knew that they were around I'd done a little bit of research on them I knew that they you know they they were very good at what they did so you know they they were a very easy option for me to go with when I um, went to buy my first purchase my first property with them down in Melbourne I did choose to try um, a different buyer's agency this second time around simply because I'd struck up a good network with someone else and I thought why not and it sort of goes to that you make your own luck uh, analogy whereas you know you're out there in the marketplace you're doing the research you're talking to people and so you come across people that you that you trust and that you have a rapport with absolutely and so it moves from there absolutely it's a nice segue into where you're going in the future and also before we get into that just about a professional team what does your professional team look like okay so that's it's a very very good question I'm glad you're asking it because it was uh, one of the things that I wanted to raise as well as a property investor you absolutely need to have a team of specialists around you if I'm the smartest person in the room I'm in trouble right I don't want to learn everything that I need to learn about tax accounting. I don't want to learn everything that I need to learn about, you know, the the where we are in the property market in Melbourne. I've got buyers agents to do that. I've got taxation accountants to do that. I don't need to know necessarily which lender to approach because I've got a really good mortgage broker who knows the ins and outs and who knows how to navigate each of these lenders. So it, it is paramount, paramount to have these guys in place. You make a very good point because as the property, as a principal property investor, you want to be concerning yourself with the bigger picture stuff with the strategy stuff the detail and the small and the small nitty-gritty of it you want somebody else to be doing that for you and you want them to give you the 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 research and then make the decisions around that absolutely absolutely i mean look i have i'm not going to lie to you i have taken you know shortcuts um in the past when i was um 
when I just moved out of the place in Paddington and I was managing it remotely once I'd moved overseas, I thought, look, I've got a good tenant in place. I can probably just manage it remotely. No need to pay, you know, X amount to a, you know, a property manager to do it for me. Now, when these guys moved out, um, you know, having to advertise a place, get my parents involved to do the viewings, the amount of administration that that entailed and doing it from a distance, it's just not, it's not my skill set. It's not my interest either. Do you know what I mean? Good point. Yeah. <laughs> interest and skill set. I mean, play, you, 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 I was talking a little bit earlier with some people and we were talking about how important it is to play a game that you can win. And then if you're doing that, then you can, you can really excel at it. And I guess what that looks like is playing a game that suits your interests and your skill sets. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and then and then and then there's Excel. Julia, I wanted to ask you just it's probably another good segue to go into it. If you look back again, um, if you could sort of compartmentalize and say these are the lessons learned, um, these are the things, these are the mistakes that I made and these are the things that I did well. How would you how would you do that? Let's start with the bad news. Let's go with the mistakes first. So when I started my property journey, I knew that I wanted to build a property portfolio. So that was my very high level sort of mission. I didn't know exactly what that portfolio would look like, right? I thought, you know, regional Australia, this, that, it doesn't really matter, just buy property and eventually it'll do well. Yes, that is true to a certain point. But, you know, as we've discussed today, had I made better decisions, I would be in a, in a very different you know, position today. You would be in a different position. You'd be a little further ahead. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So v- get very clear around. Get clear early. Exactly. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Get clear early around your strategy and, you know, and, and stick to that. So that was one of the, you know, other things that I would what would do differently. Um, again, uh, in terms of buyers agents, I should have bit the bullet and got got in, got them involved a lot earlier, right? I shouldn't have bought my first four properties on my own. And it's money well spent. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Over and over and over again. One of the things that um, I, I would do differently again is I would make sure that I've got, you know, property managers in place at all times, and not try to cut corners because I think I know the, you know, a particular city. You know, I've lived in Sydney. I know it. I'm sure that I can manage properties remotely. Well, no, not really. <laughs> and I guess another complexity that you've got as well is that you live in a different time zone. Exactly right. So look, it is only two hours behind Sydney, but it it does make a difference, and um, it really does change when you're not on the ground. You know, you don't get the, the same feel for things. It's been so interesting talking to you, and there's a couple of sort of themes that have come up for me. One of them is that it, there's no sort of too early stage to start. There is a right way and a wrong way to do it, but even if you might take a couple of wrong steps, it is a forgiving asset class, so it's probably going to be okay. But that first property that you get is key because if that one you get wrong and you don't get the luck, then maybe that's where it stops and you don't want to do that. So I think anybody starting out would would, would do well to listen to your advice and say, you know, double make sure by, by engaging with the professional team, with the professional people that know what they're doing about getting into that first one and get into the first one well. Yeah, exactly. Actually, to be honest, if I did have my time again, knowing what I know today, I would go to a buyer's agent. I would say, this is the amount of money that I have. Please help me find a property that is going to do well over time. Simple as that. I don't necessarily care what state it's in. You guys, you guys know the market a hell of a lot better than I do. You know, here's my money. Please, please help me make this decision. And, and that's terrific, isn't it? Because then you can then then they can decide. You can say, this is my budget. This is what I've got. This is how much money I've got to pay in a fee. So how much of my of your time do I get for that? And then you and then you can and then you can balance it from there. Absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, you can't have your time again, but you can do things differently going forward. So, what are your plans, your property investment plans um, for the future? One of the things that I told myself um, I didn't want to do as I was building out my portfolio, I didn't want to be putting down any of my savings into it. I wanted to rely solely on equity. So solely on refinancing, you know, the the romantic view of how to, you know, build out that portfolio. I learned, however, you know, being away, as I said, for, for the last couple of years, that that may not necessarily um, work for me, right? Um, as the lending criteria in Australia has changed, and especially the lending criteria towards foreign uh, investors, which unfortunately I am deemed to be one, yep. it, it's made things very tricky. So um, I need to be putting down a much larger deposit than I've ever had to. Um, which unfortunately does mean that I need to eat into my savings. 
right? So what I should have done um, a couple of years ago when I realized that getting finance as a foreign investor was proving to be difficult, what I should have done is I should have dipped into the savings two or three years ago, as opposed to holding on to this mindset of, oh, I will only use the equity in the houses, I'll keep the savings for a rainy day. Um, because, you know, what that has meant is that, I, you know, I, did, I wasn't able to purchase for three years. So it's just a little bit about being flexible and moving with the with the with the moving parts as they move that's going to happen all the time isn't it because as you said the the lending criteria was tightened up particularly for 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 investors and particularly for foreign investors which you are deemed to be it's starting to loosen up a little bit now again for for local for local buyers but that may change again going into into the future yeah absolutely so it swings and roundabouts swings and roundabouts and it's to play the course i guess as it's laid out and in terms of where you want to go, it sounds like you want to continue on your property investment journey. Have you got a, you talk about being, being very clear on your goals. What are your goals for the future? Um, and have you got any ideas around where it ends? I've got the age of 42 in mind for some reason, which is for me is five years down the track. I would ideally like to to be able to, you know, to be doing property on a full-time basis and not be reliant on a on a full-time job. So in order for me to get to that, um, I would need to get the portfolio to 10 mil, um, which, you know, five years down the track, it is not in, you know, entirely impossible, um, but it does mean that I need to be making right decisions between now and then. Yeah, and I mean, that's another good point, isn't it? Is that nothing is really impossible you know, within reason, but it's around being smart about how you get to that and making making good calls. And the bigger the goal is, the more important it is not to lose any way around making bad decisions. And I'm almost I'm hesitant to use the word bad decisions, but bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or to learn from the learnings along the way. And um, so 42, five years down the line, um, it's a it's a big call. Have you earmarked any um, any short-term goals, any any areas that you want to invest in? And you're going to invest, I assume, in Australia all the way through? Absolutely. So I am going to keep it to Australia. Um, I almost um, bought in the UK last year simply because I was utterly fed up and frustrated that no one would give me a loan in Australia. I had equity in the properties, but no one no one wanted to give me a loan. So I was I was very, very close to moving to the U- to, you know, investing in the UK. But I'm um, in hindsight, I'm very, very glad that I didn't. Um, the reason I say that is because I've got an excellent network in Australia. I know who to go to for all the, you know, the things that we discussed. I know who to trust. Um, so yeah, so certainly I'm going to, you know, keep keep it to within Australia. And look, um, ideally Sydney and Melbourne. In the capital cities, close to the city, in that sweet spot. It sounds like you're learning from your past experiences um, and relying on your professional team. Exactly right. Yeah, Julia, it's been really terrific having you on the show today, and. Um, It'd be great to get you back in in a, in a couple of months or, or, or years' time and have a look at how your, your portfolio has progressed and, uh, and catch up on your story then. Absolutely. would love to. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Remember to follow us on all the social media stuff, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can follow me too on Twitter at Timothy J. Neary if you want to do that. If you've enjoyed uh, today's show, leave us a five-star review, please, on iTunes. It's the best way for people to find us and to hear the great content that we are putting out. As always, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au is where you'll find us. There are plenty of stories there on the business of property investment across the whole of Australia and on my guest today, Julia Tita. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.